Well, a very good morning to all of you. Thank you so much for the privilege of sharing God's word with you this morning. And we pray that as we do so, we will indeed be blessed by his word. But before we come to God's word, let's all pray together. Let's pray. Our dear God and Heavenly Father, as we come to you, we seek again to hear you speaking to us. We know that there are many things that might preoccupy our hearts and our minds at a time like this, where many of us have many concerns about our situation. But we pray that as we lay aside this time to hear you, we ask, so, oh Lord, that we might indeed hear you speaking to each one of us. And so we commend ourselves to you and ask now that your Spirit, who is our teacher, might indeed teach us from your word. We commend ourselves to you and ask again that you be gracious to us and that our Father as we hear, we might also act upon what we hear. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, beginning today and for the next six Sundays, we'll be looking at what is famously known as Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, found in Matthew's Gospel, chapters 5 to 7. Now, consider the greatest teaching of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is admired not only by Christians, but actually is universally regarded as the right way of living by civilized people all over the world. Now, so highly did Mahmoud Gandhi regard it that when he was asked by a former British Viceroy of India in the 1930s as to what he thought would solve the problems between Great Britain and India, Gandhi actually picked up a Bible and opened it to the fifth chapter of Matthew and he said this, When your country and mine shall get together on the teachings laid down by Christ in this Sermon on the Mount, we shall have solved the problems not only of our countries, but those of the whole world. Sheikh al Tayyip, the current Grand Imam of Al-Azhar University in Cairo, Egypt, commented in an interview in 2013 that the beauty of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount regularly brings tears to his eyes. And he went on to say that Jesus came to save societies from the throes of materialism, unbridled passions, and deadly selfishness, and to prepare them for a new paradigm. Now, given the testimonies of these men who are not Christians, don't you think it incumbent upon us, as professing Christians, to give some attention to this famous sermon. Who knows? Perhaps our better understanding of it can fuel our enthusiasm to speak to those who know this sermon that they might come to see Christ and his uniqueness and why it is that they, as much as we, must listen to him and follow him. Now that's my prayer and hope during this series of sermons. Before we plunge in, let me make one preliminary comment mainly to manage expectations. Huh? Given that there's so much I could say, and there is a lot if you are to gauge by the 60 sermons huh, preached by the late Martin Lloyd-Jones, you can expect that I won't be touching upon every detail of Jesus' teaching in this series. And so if you wish to explore further, can you please read up Martin Lloyd-Jones' studies in the Sermon on the Mount, or else John Stott's Christian counterculture. Now with that, let's turn our attention to this famous sermon and we're going to focus just on the first 10 verses. And I want to begin with a clarification, number one, followed secondly by an explanation of these 10 verses. Clarification. I assume you all know that these 10 verses are widely known as the Beatitudes, based upon, of course, the blessed word, uh, the repeated word blessed in these verses. Now, there are eight blesseds in these 10 verses, though uh, there is another one in verse 
11. I don't know if you see that. That has led some commentators to conclude that there are nine Beatitudes instead of eight. Though my personal opinion is there are only eight. Why? Do you notice how in verse 3 and again also in verse 10, the promise of Jesus is the same in both verses. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now in all the other verses, the promises after each blessed are all very different, aren't they? But here in verse 3 and again in verse 10, the promise is the same. And I think there's a good reason for this, as we shall soon see. Notice as well, Jesus' promises in verses 3 and 10 are both in the present tense. This is like studying English, isn't it? Uh, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Look at verses 4 to 9. For they shall, they shall, they shall. They're all in the future tense. Do you notice that? So all the indications are that Jesus meant verses 3 and 10 to be the bookends of this whole passage. That's why verses 3 and 10 contain the same promise and have the same tense. They tell us the Beatitudes proper begin at verse 3 and ends at verse 10. But what about ninth blessed in verse 11? Why isn't it a beatitude? Well, what is the subject in verse 10? Blessed are those who are persecuted, right? What is the subject in verses 11 and 12? It is persecution as well, do you notice? So it would seem to me, therefore, that Jesus, in verses 11 and 12, is clarifying the eight beatitude found in verse 10. The blessed in verse 11 is not exactly another beatitude. Rather, it is an exposition, an explanation of the eight beatitude in verse 10. Now, something else we need to notice. Jesus begins this sermon with the third personal pronoun in chapter 5, verses 3 to 10. For theirs is the kingdom of God. For they shall. Verses 3 to 10. But in verse five, uh, in verse eleven, chapter five, verse eleven, he switches to the second personal pronoun. Do you see that? Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you. And do you know, for the rest of the sermon, right up to chapter seven, verse twenty, he sustains this second personal pronoun: you, 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 you. Now, why is that so? Well, according to chapter 5, verse 1, it is because there are two audiences who heard his sermon that day. They were the crowds and they were the disciples. So two groups there. And according to chapter 7, verse 28, the crowds were still there at the end of the sermon. When Jesus finished these teachings, the crowds were astonished at his teachings. Now, I want to suggest that each time Jesus said you, he was actually addressing his disciples and indeed he was speaking to them primarily and only secondarily to the crowds. Now, who were these disciples? Well, we are introduced to four of them in chapter 4, verses 18 to 22. There is Peter, Andrew, James and John. And as they heard Jesus, we are told there, they decided to pack up their business to follow Jesus. Thus, you could say this sermon was primarily for them, for those who have already committed themselves to Jesus, chosen to give up everything to follow him. That, by the way, is confirmed by Jesus' promise in verses 3 and 10. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is a favorite phrase on Jesus' lips in this gospel. Do you know that of the 32 occurrences, 32 occurrences of this phrase in the whole Bible, all are found in Matthew's gospel. Isn't that amazing? Now Matthew has purposely repeated that phrase on Jesus' lips because he wants us to realize that 
that if we are to understand his gospel, and may I add Jesus' famous Sermon on the Mount, we need to pay close attention to this phrase, the kingdom of heaven. Mind you, it not only envelops the Beatitudes, verse 3 and verse 10, it is there in chapter 5, verses uh, uh, 19 to 20, is there embedded in the Lord's Prayer in chapter 6, verse 10? It is there in Jesus' great words, seek first the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven in chapter 6, verse 33. And as it comes to the end of the sermon, Jesus actually mentions it again in chapter 7, verse 21. So it has a prominent place in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Not only so, the kingdom of heaven is mentioned at crucial points in this gospel. You see, the gospel here begins with John the Baptist, introduced in chapter 3, verse 2. And he came preaching, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And if you go on to chapter 4, verse 17, we are introduced to Jesus in the same way. From that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And you know, when the disciples were sent out for the first time by Jesus to preach the gospel, they were told by Jesus in chapter 10, verse 7, And proclaim as you go, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Fascinating, isn't it? How at each crucial step of the way, the same message is to be proclaimed. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. And what John the Baptist and our Lord and his disciples simply meant was this. The kingdom of heaven has invaded the kingdom of earth. Heaven has come down to earth when Jesus came and walked this earth more than 2,000 years ago. And with him has come all the principles, all the values and standards of heaven. And those who seek to join him and his kingdom, they will have to adopt and live by those very principles, values and standards, which according to Jesus are very different from the principles, values and standards of this world. And there's going to be a clash between the two, as we shall see. Now this is especially borne out by the Beatitudes, and needless to say by this famous sermon as a whole. What do I mean? Well, just take these Beatitudes. Note the three truths Jesus emphasizes about them. Here is an explanation about the Beatitudes. First of all, and this is already hinted at, the Beatitudes describe the kind of people who belong to the kingdom of heaven. They describe Jesus' disciples, those who have chosen to follow him. They tell us the indispensable attributes of an authentic disciple of Jesus. Now, I'm not saying if you're not a disciple, you won't display some of these attributes. We all know of people, don't we, who are not Christians and who, for example, are meek. I remember a colleague of mine many years ago, he was a devout Buddhist, but, you know, uh, he was very meek. Uh, but for all his meekness, he wasn't particularly poor in spirit. Why do I say that? He was quite self-righteous, you see, about his meekness. You know what I mean, isn't it? You can be proud about the fact that you are not so proud. That, unfortunately, was what I observed about him after a while. Now, what Jesus presents here is a whole package. He's not saying, if you're my disciple, you'll be poor in spirit, and that's it. No, no. These Beatitudes are one huge package. You either have all of them or you don't. You're poor in spirit, you say. Good. But do you also mourn? Are you meek? Do you seek after righteousness? Are you merciful, pure in heart, a peacemaker? You know, this whole list here is not unlike the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 to 23. You know that one, don't you? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, meekness, temperance, faith. 
That's a whole package as well. If you are a Christian, you're not just loving. You ought also to be joyful and patient and gentle and meek and temperate. You can't opt out of any of them. So too with these Beatitudes of Jesus. If you, came to, if you claim to be a follower of Jesus Christ, are all these Beatitudes true of you? Not just one, two, even three. All eight of them. Are you displaying these qualities, these attributes, more and more as you go on in your walk with the Lord Jesus Christ? Because if you are a disciple, that should be true of you. So can I add, test yourself by these beatitudes. They're very good indication as to whether you are an authentic disciple of Jesus Christ or not. Mark, the beatitudes are primarily concerned with what you are rather than what you do. Do you notice of the eight, only two address what you do? Verse 7, blessed are the merciful. And verse 9, blessed are the peacemakers. You know, the rest describe who you are, what you are. And that is characteristic of Jesus' teaching. He is far more interested in who we are rather than what we do. You see it right here in the sermon. Look at Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 and 22, for example. He says that it is not the act of murder which constitutes murder. Rather, everyone who is angry with his brother even if it is hidden right in here, has murdered him. Chapter 5, verses 27 to 28, is not the act of adultery which constitutes adultery. Rather, everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And when you get to Matthew chapter 6, well, Jesus condemns all outward appearances of religiosity. It doesn't matter whether it's prayer, fasting, charity. If you perform them for the sake of gaining a reputation among men, Jesus says it's all humbug. So it's not surprising. Time and again, Jesus points out the significance of what is in our heart, our innermost being. He calls out the Pharisees in Matthew chapter 12 verse 34. You brood of vipers, how can you speak good when you are evil for out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. Again in Matthew chapter 15 verses 19 to 20 Jesus says for out of our hearts come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile anyone. So Jesus is very interested, not in the externals, is he? He's very concerned about the condition of our hearts. Now you know why the Beatitudes are primarily concerned about what we are, what you are, not what we do. For even in the most pious acts and deeds, we can entertain, can't we, an evil motive, a wicked intention which may be hidden. We can so easily cover up our real motive and intention for what we do. And Jesus knows that. That's why his emphasis on who you are what you are rather than what you do. There's no place therefore in the Beatitudes is there for what I call a disparity, a disconnect between your heart and your deeds. While showing mercy, peacemaking are commendable, Jesus is just as concerned, in fact more interested to know if you are poor in spirit, meek and pure as you exercise those merciful and peaceful so let's keep that in mind. Huh? Those attributes of the Beatitudes are part and parcel of who we are as Christians.
Not only do they describe our attributes, they actually have a very spiritual emphasis. Do you notice there's not a word here about our material possessions as a blessing? That, by the way, is the world's understanding of blessing. That's their beatitudes. You're blessed if you're rich. You're blessed if you're healthy, you're comfortable. But that's not Jesus' beatitudes, is it? Rather, Jesus' beatitudes are primarily concerned with righteousness. Do you see that in the fourth beatitude in verse 6? And again in the eighth and final beatitude in verse 10. Now I discovered, preparing this sermon, that no other word receive the same kind of attention as righteousness in the Sermon on the Mount. Just so you know what I'm saying. Turn to Matthew chapter 5 verse 20. And Jesus says there in chapter 5 verse 20, I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, by any standard of their day, the scribes and Pharisees were considered the most pious, religious, and spiritual people. And Jesus says, that's not good enough. Sorry. You've got to do better than them. Otherwise, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, why? Jesus, this is asking for the impossible. It's just too much. And yet, that is what Jesus plainly demands from us. Now, it's not till you read the succeeding verses that you begin to realize that by righteousness, Jesus doesn't mean mere morality, the observance of religious practices, or any outward show of religiosity. Doesn't Jesus say in chapter 5, verse 21 and verse 22, you have heard that it was said you should not murder but I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Verses 27 to 28. You have heard that it was said you should not commit adultery, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery. Now if you go down the list in the remainder of chapter 5, whether it's divorce, swearing, vengefulness, loving your enemies, one after another, Jesus takes what he says is the righteousness prescribed by the scribes and the Pharisees and he says that's not righteousness that's not the kind of righteousness anyway which will get you into the kingdom of heaven and as you read on in his sermon you soon realize how very radically different Jesus understanding of righteousness is not only from the scribes and Pharisees may I add also from us today now, why do I say that? Because the righteousness he commands is found in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. Note what he says there. Matthew 6, 33. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Whose righteousness? God's righteousness. And all these things will be added to you. Now, that's the kind of righteousness that Jesus expects. The kind that exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. God's righteousness. God's righteousness, according to the Bible, is what? Perfect. I'm not surprised, are you, that Jesus should say in Matthew chapter 5, verse 48, You therefore must be perfect, even as your heavenly Father is perfect. That's it. That's what Jesus is driving at in this Sermon on the Mount. If you are my disciples, then you are to be perfect as your Heavenly Father is perfect. That's what he means in Matthew chapter 5, verses 44 to 45, isn't it? Matthew 5, 44 to 45. Why must Christians love their enemies and pray for them? And pray for even those who persecute them. So that you may be sons and daughters of your Father who is in heaven. And what is our Father in heaven like? He makes his sun rise on the evil 
and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. That's what God is like. And if you are his sons and daughters, then you have to be like him. So show it. Demonstrate it by loving your enemies and praying for those who persecute you. Can you see why Jesus couched the Beatitudes in the way he did here? For if the righteousness demanded of us is nothing less than God's righteousness, which spells perfect, remember? Then you and I are habesla. Finished. We are all done for, aren't we? For none of us, none of us can claim perfect righteousness. The saying, no one's perfect, is not merely a cliche, please. That's the truth about every one of us this morning. We can make no claim to perfect righteousness. The question is, do you recognize it in yourself? Do you acknowledge that you have no perfect righteousness? That's what the Beatitudes is driving us to. They describe people who have come to acknowledge, for example, their spiritual poverty before the perfect standard of God's righteousness. Thus, blessed are the poor in spirit. They've come to see how they ought to be sorry and remorseful for coming short of that perfect righteousness. And thus, blessed are those who mourn. And because they recognize how far short they've fallen of God's perfect righteousness, they have nothing to be proud of. And thus, blessed are the meek. And recognizing how far short they are of their perfect righteousness, they long to be more perfectly righteous. And thus, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. Do you see how it all fits in? How it all fits in into Jesus' teaching on righteousness. If God's perfect righteousness is a standard demanded of us, and it is, then we can't help being all of that. So the Beatitudes describe the spiritual attributes of those who recognize the demands of God's perfect righteousness and acknowledge how far short they've fallen of it. And therefore, how much how much they are in need of God's grace and mercy if they are to enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, one final truth about these Beatitudes. Note how the first half of each Beatitude is cast in the present tense. And the second half is in the future tense. Do you see that in verses 4 to 9? Now, there's a good reason for that. Think of it like this. The first half of each beatitude answers the question, who are blessed? Who are the people who are blessed? Those who are poor in spirit, those who mourn, those who are meek, and so on. These are the people who are blessed. That's the first half. The second half answers a somewhat different question. Why are they blessed? Why are those who mourn blessed? They are blessed for because they shall be comforted. Why are the meek blessed? Because they shall inherit the earth. Why are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness blessed? Because they shall be satisfied. You see the connection between the two. Now that is not to say these blessings will become a reality only in the future, please. Doesn't Jesus say blessed are the poor in spirit? He doesn't say, does he? Blessed shall be the poor in spirit. No, no, no. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Meaning, of course, you're blessed even now if you're poor in spirit. Of course, you will not know the full blessing of this until the future. But that doesn't mean you're not blessed now. You are. I hope that has been your experience, huh? as it has been mine. Granted, huh? All this talk about being poor in spirit and moaning and being meek, I mean, they sound rather morbid and sad and depressing, isn't it? I don't know about you. When I read this, sometimes I think it's not very encouraging for my self-esteem. 
And yet, you know, there's nothing quite so helpful and beneficial as to know myself, my true standing before God. You see, the Beatitudes tell me exactly who I am before God. And since God knows me better than myself, the Beatitudes give me a true estimate of myself. Not what others say I am, not even what I perceive myself to be, but what God knows me to be. I mean, if we are honest, many of us really don't know ourselves as we should, do we? At times, we overrate ourselves. At other times, we underrate ourselves. And the reason is because we don't know ourselves as we ought to. But when you measure yourself against the Beatitudes, you soon recognize who you are. And can I say, that's a great blessing because not many people know who they are. That's why <coughs> counselors, may I add psychologists, uh, psychiatrists even, are in such great demand these days, aren't they? It's because so many people don't understand themselves and therefore don't know how to handle themselves. I think it's really sad reading in the news how many, many movie stars, singers, and they're so young and they all have committed suicide, correct? And the reason is because they don't really know themselves. So it's a good thing to know ourselves and to know ourselves as God knows us. But we cannot ignore the equally clear future emphasis having said that. For there's a sense in which these promises are true not only as a daily continuing experience from the moment you become a disciple of Jesus Christ. They are true all the way till you die. And beyond that to Jesus coming again. They are true all the way. Being poor in the spirit is not just a one-off thing. Rather, it is a daily experience. That's why it's in the future. Time and again, you come to see how spiritually poor you are. And each time, as you acknowledge your spiritual poverty, God will confirm in you that yours is the kingdom of heaven. That's the blessedness. So too with moaning. You don't merely moan over your sins at the beginning when you first became a Christian. If you have been a disciple for as long as I have, you will know that there is always some sin daily you will have to moan over each day. Some years ago, I was writing to a young man who longed very much to be a good and faithful disciple of Jesus. And he mentioned how he had become very, very angry with God because of a particular predicament he was going through. He wished he hadn't gotten angry with God, but he had. And he moaned the fact that despite all the years of experiencing God's goodness, faithfulness, somehow he still hadn't learned how to trust God without grumbling and complaining. Do you feel that way sometimes, young people? You keep telling yourself you must trust him, you must trust his word, but in no time you are at it again. You're grumbling, you're complaining about him. Now, this young man had that problem. I don't know about you, but I have great hope in that young man that he's truly a disciple of Jesus Christ. Why? Because he genuinely sorrowed, moaned over his angry outburst against God. And I have no doubts that God will comfort him with his forgiveness, reassure him of his acceptance. Mind you, as I said, this will go on for as long as we are this side of heaven. So blessed are the poor in spirit. Even now, blessed are those who mourn over their sin. Even now, blessed are the meek right here and now. You know, the whole of our lives as citizens of the kingdom of heaven is just this. Daily repentance, daily moaning, daily forgiveness, daily renewal, daily blessing from the Lord himself. That is what the Beatitudes remind us of. 
But do remember as well that God's full blessings promised here will be known one day by you and by me. When Christ comes again, redeems all those who are his, full salvation will be ours at that time. So can I add, don't despair if you find you are constantly stumbling along the way at the moment. That will be your lot and my lot for as long as we are alive. But one day, we won't stumble anymore. When Jesus comes again, we will receive his full comfort, our full inheritance, our full satisfaction and his full mercy and more. So can I encourage you, take courage, even if you're stumbling along the way, and go on with your walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. May the Lord grant you his favor and blessing as you do so. Well, let's all pray. Our dear God and Heavenly Father, we thank you for these words of comfort. Blessed indeed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who are indeed meek and moan for their sins. Blessed because we can know your full forgiveness. We can know how much you love us as you actually restore us, renew our spirits day by day. We thank you therefore that it is a wonderful thing to be a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ because it comes with these multiple blessings. Help us therefore to enjoy these blessings. But help us as well to live by the Beatitudes, that our God, we may constantly examine ourselves before you and let you pierce through our hearts with your light and show us where we are before you and grant to us the honesty and sincerity to admit our fallenness and our shortcomings and our sins and thereby confess them and find forgiveness in you and in the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so as we come to you, we thank you that these blessings will indeed be ours, not only now, but also at the day when Christ shall come again, when we shall enjoy these blessings to the full. Therefore, grant us hope, grant us courage, encourage us as we go along. And even when we do stumble, O oh, our Lord, pick us up and help us and restore to us the joy of your salvation. We thank you for all this in Jesus' name. Amen.